When the routing guide fails and you need extra capacity, it helps to have a strategic partner. That's where Surge Transportation's real-time pricing and capacity come in. Built on our proprietary logic and market data, the real-time pricing tool provides instant market pricing, backed by a 100% tender accept guarantee. With instant rates, simple integration, and guaranteed acceptance, we take the unpredictability out of sourcing extra truckload capacity. to truck it i'm dooner here with michael vincent the dude and a special guest introduce yourself young man i'm tony mulvey uh senior analyst here at freight waves happy to make my debut on what the truck and this yeah. is your debut it is sweet so, well, happy reason monday, for that because it's monday right yep, and it is. you woke up and there was a big news story that came across the wire and michael vincent and i didn't have enough time to learn about it yeah. so we had to bring an expert on here well i'm happy to be here i mean it's uh it was a big deal especially at nine o'clock nine a.m news drop i mean Better than the Friday 6 o'clock p.m. news drop. <laughs> yeah, we're ready to hit this week. So today on the show, we're going to get into that. We're going to get into the logistics behind retail packaging and displays. Yeah. Big peak season coming up in retail. Find out all about that from Bay Cities. We got a future of freight segment with Convoy, Global Trans Director of Wellness. She's going to come on here. She's going to get our minds right for this peak season, too. Bunch of news, bunch of weird stuff that happened. We might even review the movie Fall. You see that oh. one yet? I, I haven't. <laughs> Two girls stuck on top of a 2,000-foot radio tower? Interesting. What's going to happen? How do they fill 90 minutes of that movie? Can oh, they? Geez. Not All really kinds of well. crazy hijinks. <laughs> All kinds of hijinks. Well, let's tip our sponsor, <laughs> and then we'll get to some news here. Surge Transportation thinks non-competes are stupid. Non-competes chase away good talent and stop talented people from joining the supply chain industry. Tear up your non-compete. It's not enforceable. Instead, email jobs at surgetransportation.com and do what? Open your own office tomorrow, obviously. Come on now. All right, headlines. All right. By the way, did you know that Tony right here is an expert, a certified expert on the rules of golf? Yep. How does one become a certified expert? You go to the USGA PGA workshop, rules workshops. It's a three-day workshop. I think they offer them now virtually and in person. But you take a 100-question test, 50 open book, 50 closed book. And anything above 90 on that test yeah. is an expert. Now, I've seen those convoy guys play golf before. What do you think is one rule that they're constantly breaking? Oh, that's a tough one. I mean, there's so many. I mean, there's so many. I, <laughs> that they I break? play golf. Oh, there's so many that they break yeah, I mean, there's so many. <laughs> they're just seeing them golf. There. They're easy to break. I mean, yeah. they, they really are. And they're there to not get you in trouble, but they tend to get you in trouble a lot more than a they're there to help you, you. Is it true that you get three mulligans per hole as they play at a convoy? Uh, I <laughs> wish that was the case. That might be a lot better. <laughs> you know, they're great at wheelbarrow races, too. We had them down yeah. in Arkansas. They did a fantastic <laughs> thing. We're just picking on them because they're going to be on the show right after we get on the news over here. And I can see Spencer in the green room laughing. So that's why we're carrying it on. Anyway, so the big news that you woke up for that we needed to find out more about was Heartland Express, right? It said today that they're going to acquire contract freighters, non-dedicated U.S. dry van and temperature-controlled truckload business and CFI logistic operations. I guess that's their Mexican mm -hmm. operations. Um, from TFI International, $525 million. What's going on here? Yeah, so Heartland buying CFI. So if you think about CFI as a company, they run a lot of that north-south freight along the I-35 corridor. They were competitors with Celadon along that. Celadon, obviously, went mm. under back in 2019. Sure. So, I mean, it's really a big deal. It's it's an acquisition that Heartland, I mean, when you think about how Heartland operates, uh, in the past, they've really been very targeted in their approaches. I think this is another one of those areas that's targeted. But it's an air, or it's a, what you've seen in a lot of these acquirers like TFI, where they purchased uh, US, UPS Freight. You see Knight Swift doing the same thing, purchasing AAA Cooper. They're getting out of the truckload side. I mean, they're they're going more into that out of that commoditized truckload uh, space. And what you're seeing is Heartland. I mean, that's what they do. That's what they do best. Yeah. And they're, one, I mean, you look at what they said in the uh, release, they want to have a consolidated operating ratio at 85. 
Yeah, well, Maybe. me too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that'd be great in truckload, yeah. right? 85 exactly. is awesome. It's great. Yeah, yeah it is. Ir- a lot of irregular uh, route yep. asset based, right? Yep. And some of the comments uh, that I saw like on Twitter were like, why would you be going into spot market at a time when that is really difficult? Is that really the strategy that's going on here? Before we even move past there, irregular oh, routing, I actually had a question too from someone in the audience who said, what is irregular routing? That had been a feature in the stories we've read oh, okay, about that cool. so far. What is irregular routing and why would they be interested in that? Yeah, I mean, so irregular routing is... I mean, the best way to compare it is to dedicated, right? Yeah. Dedicated, you're running from point A to point B, yeah. and that's all you run. This is, you still have a network, but it's, hey, you may go point A to point B to point C, or you may go point A to point C. It's just not, it's regular. It's, yeah. it's not consistent. And yeah. I mean, you have contract business and spot business, but sure. again, why you do it in into this market, I mean, it's a way to access drivers, right? Yeah. It's, you're building something that already has that, you're buying something that has that brand recognition, yeah. right? CFI has been known for, it's been been around for a while. Sure. I mean, Craig this morning on no, the- No, the th- purchase is, is, makes sense. It, yeah. was, it was more the irregular versus spot. Irregular yeah. doesn't necessarily mean, mean it's spot. spot. Yep, exactly. Right. So it's just more of the, it's not, you don't have that dedicated lane A to B. I mean, you do some cases, but yeah. you can get out of that. So the too. size of this deal, this, this makes um, them pretty big, yeah? Yeah, I mean, they'll be the eighth largest truckload fleet third largest irregular routing fleet. I mean, you think about who they're competing with, Schneiders, uh, your Werner, yeah. U.S. Expresses. So, I mean, it's making Heartland, it's giving Heartland this big boost to the size of the company. And then it's a, obviously, they view it as accretive to their earnings, which as a publicly traded company, that's what you're looking for. Yeah, you want yeah. your earnings to secrete. Makes sense. Oh, <laughs> creative. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, creative. That much. That's much better. Uh, so let's hear it from the man himself, Michael Gurdon. He's chairman, president, and CEO at Heartland. In terms of what's going to happen here, you mentioned it, multiple brands. So w- what happens with operations here? Well, they said, we are thrilled to welcome CFI to Heartland Express family of companies where we'll continue to operate from Joplin under its own brand and current leadership team. CFI has exactly what we look for as uh, we expand significant scale, respected and recognized brand, capable management, safe and experienced drivers, a strong asset base, and a complementary terminal network. Very of the many things that you had just said. Yeah, I mean, it, that's why, I, I mean, overall, I mean, you heard me and Craig talk about it this morning on Freight Waves now. It, it makes sense, especially you're headed into a time where M&A is going to make sense in the truckload space. I mean, you talk about the falling spot market. Right now, you're going to have people that are wanting just to get out, to get yeah. out, and then those that want to build brands. And that's kind of what this is. It's building that overall brand uh, in an era, at a time where others aren't necessarily focused on that. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, we have one more story. It's freight broker sentiment shaky into the back half of 2022. Not really a surprising survey, but it's one the FreightWaves research team did. They talked to 160 plus brokerages to find out how they're feeling about things. On the first chart here, you can see what do you expect from each of the following at the end of Q3 versus the beginning of Q3. What were most people saying here? They were expecting rates to be what? I mean, they're expecting spot, especially spot to decline. The contract rates there, it's on that far right side, really to be flat to down. I mean, that was the overall sentiment. Higher or more available capacity, lower margins, lower volumes. Kind of goes into what we've been saying here at Freight Waves. When you start looking at some of the sonar data, what they're saying matches up with what we've been seeing over the past few months. Sure. And why do they think that? Well, to their knowledge, what are their current shipment volumes? Take a look at this. Here's what they have to say about it. They most said they're uh, somewhat lower than their target. Very few, you know, the middle was right on target, somewhat higher than in target. But, you know, a lot of them are starting to experience that softness in the market, it seems like. Absolutely. And I had a conversation with a broker last week that I don't think was even in the survey and talking about what I mean, they're trying to retain customers, their shipper customers, and that's exactly what they've been talking about, their management team to these brokers. I mean, that seems to be the the concern. And we're seeing it. We see it in the survey and we see it in the data. Well, if they're exposed to spot right now, yeah. we're starting the week at a dollar eighty nine minus fuel. Yeah. On this next one here, dollar eighty nine minus fuel. Yeah, and you see that big precipitous drop off they've seen. And as we've talked to a lot of guests on here, when you go, what are you anticipating from peak? And uh, George Abernathy said electric because of uh, a number of other like side deals, but a lot of people said, you know, we got to get through that mix. It yeah. hasn't yeah. been a lot of strong sentiment. Yeah. yeah, and you think about it. I mean, we've seen contract rates kind of fall uh, starting in August, and right. So, yeah. I mean, that's that's a concern as well. And so you've got spot falling, contract falling, 
rejection rates at their lowest level that they've been, volumes declining other than the reefer side. So on the dry van side, you're seeing it really decline. And yeah. you're headed into a peak season that when you start looking at some of this consumer data, is like, are consumers as strong as what not, they're definitely not as strong as what they've been. Yeah. yeah. But are they as strong as what some, maybe some of the yeah. status is, is telling? Is it strong enough to eat up that extra contract capacity and drop into the spot? Yeah. I, probably yeah, not. That's oh. kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you, Tony. Awesome. Appreciate your time awesome. today. Thank Thanks you. for coming on the show. Thanks, guys. Good stuff. Take care. A little cowbell for you. All right, now it's time for our Future Afraid interview brought to you by Convoy. Convoy builds technology to solve the toughest problems in the freight industry. Let's welcome Spencer Henniger. He's a VP of sales over at Convoy. And Spencer, I don't think the Convoy team really has any improprietary going on in golf. Maybe a foot wedge here and there every now and again, <laughs> but that's about it. Nice well, you to know, meet you guys. <laughs> nice to meet you. You know, um, I was looking into your background here, and you were one of those guys from the Coyote Den. I mean, I think you spent over a decade there. Tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, so I was one of the earlier members of the Coyote team, spent uh, just over 12 years there, uh, worked with great people in various capacities. So, you know, in the early days, we were asked to wear many different hats. So in just the first few years when I was in Atlanta, I was a ca Canadian carrier sales rep. Uh, managed a Midwest carrier sales team, and even managed our budding LTL product uh, all, in, all in the first couple of years. And then, you know, then I moved to Chicago to help pioneer Coyote's outsource managed transportation solutions uh, product, and eventually led the sales team uh, responsible for that for that service line. Uh, but in the last few years there, uh, I took on more traditional sales management roles, both in the mid market and enterprise space, and and even helped manage our uh, our Mexican office uh, for for uh, a bit there. But you know, I credit a lot of my success to the entrepreneurial culture that the Silvers created. You know, early on, and you know, they made sure that they got the most out of their team. So I look back on my time there, you know, very fondly. Yeah, you know. Um... Spencer, with every cycle, there's all kinds of different challenges that are going on, right? The cycle that was artificial from the from the pandemic and then coming out of it, et cetera. Um, what do you think is different about the cycle that we're going through right now? We see this kind of softening happening. Yeah, so you know, I I, I agree with the sentiment that that was shared in the the survey that you just you just released. Um, you know, one of the biggest differences that we're seeing in this cycle is the role that technology and data are playing. Uh, in just the last three years, since the last, you know, quote, trough, there's been such an influx of new technology for transportation and procurement and an influx of adoption, right? We're seeing a lot more, uh, more and more of our shipper customers that are uh, increasing their willingness to try, you know, dynamic pricing solutions like the one that was uh, advertised from Surge and guaranteed primary like we have here at Convoy. Uh, specifically, customers are communicating that not only are they interested in dynamic pricing solutions, now they're actually taking guaranteed primary and comparing it to many other uh, dynamic solutions that are API integrated and offer real-time pricing. Well, so let's talk about that a little bit. So let's talk about Convoy's role in this because in the past two years, we've been talking about this cycle and it's been, you know, it's been moving, it's been a spin cycle. It's been moving all over the place. Where does Convoy fit into this, especially over these past two and a half years with uh, not that much clarity? Yeah, so you know we th we think about the ebb and flow of market conditions as really introducing this you know win loss scenario whether whether the market's tight uh, and and trucks are harder to come by or the market's soft and you know customers might think that they're they're overpaying on their on their contract uh, we we've really tried to somewhat abandon that win loss mentality and and that's what. Uh, led to the introduction of guaranteed primary in 2020, um, and we think it's a new approach to primary freight. And and you know, in a tight market, what guaranteed primary offered was 100% tender acceptance, and uh, that great service quality was not really something that customers had to you know pay through the nose on and go to the spot market where uh, competing brokerages are you know really trying to capture massive gross margins to make up for the, the losses on contract. It's a, it's a real modest uh, pricing program that, that really introduces flexibility. 
And that's what we were focused on. And then as the market starts to soften, you can see the benefits of really the idea that our guaranteed primary rates are predictive of you know, future market conditions. So what that allows for is that you know, as rates are starting to decrease, our customers' spend starts to go down. And what I think is really interesting in either market condition is the fact that you know, as we collaborate with our shippers and introduce automation to lower some of their, some of their cost to serve, uh, accessorials, incidental costs, as those are lowered on a shipment by shipment basis, that savings is passed on immediately and it's all automated. So, so this, you know, introduction to, you know, of transparency and technology into this win loss cycle that we're in, we think is tremendously benefited our customers and we're seeing that in the results, right? So, you know, in just in, in the year and a half since we launched the program, we've seen our customers save an average of 11%. And, uh, and that's on, the prevailing market conditions, not just on what's in the contract. And then they've also gotten 17% higher tender acceptance versus the average. So uh, the benefits are, are outstanding for our shippers. That's amazing. So for a shipper who's adopted this, how does this change like their day-to-day -day operations from a day-to-day, -day, from that type of perspective? Is this like a dedicated thing or, or how does it actually work? How does it impact them on a day basis? Yeah, it's a good question. So you know, really, when we think about the benefits of the program, it all starts with how it's introduced. And we introduce it with as much flexibility as possible. We want to meet our customers, you know, technologically where they want to be met, whether that's through a TMS or you know, direct into their uh, their operating system. We're automating the uh, rates on a day-to-day -day level. And, and we're, we're, we're operating in really multiple facets of the network. So whether that's, you know, business critical, high volume lanes, or, you know, difficult to source, maybe lower volume lanes that are in scarce parts of the network, you know, our, our network of over 400,000 trucks is able to, is able to offer that hundred percent tender acceptance, uh, which has really just been a huge benefit to, to our teams and, and the procurement folks at, at a lot of our uh, shipper partners that have adopted this program, they've communicated the benefit of, you know, not needing to go back and mini bid when they think costs are going down or when service starts to suffer or, you know, reprice the entire network altogether. A lot of those needs have been eliminated because of the automation that this program introduces. Wow. Okay. Well, like, hey, in these markets, especially in the past year, a lot of predictions have been made about what is going to happen. Uh, it seems like there's a new news story about some sort of political event or global event or local event that is happening that can throw another wrench in the system. What do you recommend people do to stay ahead of the market? Yeah, it's a good question. So, you know, I, I would say three things, Tim. So first and foremost, diversify your freight procurement portfolio, similar to a financial portfolio. And I'm not just talking about, you know, assets and, and non-asset providers. I'm actually talking about the procurement mechanisms that are pervasive throughout your network. You know, there are going to be certain parts of your network that are really, really strong and require that long-term dedicated contract rate, but you're also going to want to have the flexibility and the dynamic pricing mechanisms like a guaranteed primary to help mitigate uh, cost and service disruptions, right? So that's first is, is diversify. Second is, you know, it's important that shippers raise the expectations for operational visibility. Uh, you know, now more than ever, the concept of having really high fidelity shipment tracking and the benefits that that high fidelity shipment tracking affords our shippers is through facility insights, right? So we're able to go and offer facility by facility insights by time of day, dwell times, operational inefficiencies. And what that allows for is a really collaborative and rich conversation with our with our shipper partners to where we can start to lower their cost to serve and make their freight more attractive in the industry. Uh, and that that benefit really is automated automatically uh, delivered to the to the client in, in the guaranteed primary network. Uh, and then finally, just the general introduction of res resilience into your into your network. I think if I were sitting in front of a customer right now, I would I would tell them that, you know, the more the more flexibility, 
The more elasticity that they can introduce into their supply chain, the better. And whether that's you know through a diversif diversification of uh, partners or diversification of uh, pricing mechanisms, it's really all about ensuring that as much of the future that is unknown, if you have the right resilience in your supply chain, you'll be able to forge that future much more effectively. Spencer, thank you so much. Uh, perfect words to end on. I, I think we uh, we all need Amen. to be guided by those ones and maybe uh, Convoy as well. Thanks so much for your time today. Absolutely. Thanks, fellas. Go check it out. Check out Convoy team. The Convoy. Good, Get on that board. All right. Meanwhile. Fucking nice. <laughs> Get your keys. Get your keys. Get your keys. Why oh, you got a piece of gunner? Alright, those guys those guys <laughs> might cut the music. Those guys might need a new package. <laughs> Talking to Josh Lydon right now and maybe Chad Sadler at Bay City's packaging. I see Josh right across from me. Josh, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, doing well, guys. Great to see you and uh, glad to be on the show again. I, You know, you post some of the most interesting content that I see online because I don't know a ton of people who work in the retail packaging space. But every time like I'm at a Target or Walmart, my kids go nuts over like those trains and those displays over yeah. in the toy yeah, section. Yeah. They're like moths to a, uh, a bug zapper. They still make <laughs> bug zappers? Sure. I don't know. They should. <laughs> they should. Well, hey, so Andrew. yeah, we're, we're definitely we're definitely responsible for helping uh, uh, distract your kids and uh, empty your wallets um, <laughs> when it comes to uh, getting the attention at the store level. So yeah, we definitely uh, help uh, draw some of that attention with some of the displays and packaging. We help ship uh, for many brands and retailers uh, uh, across the across the world here. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a huge, I was watching one of the videos on your site, uh, and it looks like a huge process. Like, you guys undertake this from design all the way down to deployment. What goes into the process behind this? Like, what we're watching right now, this case study, what was that all about? How do brands interact with you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, really what brands usually come to us, um, there's two ways, right? One is when they actually are given a program from that retailer and say, hey, look, we have an idea for you. Let's put you on an in cap. Let's put you in a half pallet. And then they'll come to a company like Bay Cities and be like, hey, help us do this. Um, and then on the other hand, there's brands are like, hey, look, we're trying to innovate. We have a new product. We want to go to the retailer with some concepts, with some ways to think differently outside of the box, no pun intended, when they're at the store level. And that's really what they do with us. So we take that creative process and then we turn that into the design process where we're actually catting it and creating white samples and, you know, the line drawing that you see here. Um, and then we get that into production where they're actually cutting it and producing it and then get that into pack out where they actually build it, load it with the product. And then we'll work with the logistics side, which is kind of what we want to talk a little bit about today, which is kind of our Bay Cities 360 um, which it looks like Chad might be having some difficulties here. But then we kind of help with the logistics and getting that outbound to the retailer, whether that be prepaid or collect, and really tracking and streamlining that process. So there's not a lot of, you know, back and forth moving product to and from facilities. I mean, you can literally bring in the containers straight from, you know, wherever it's being uh, manufactured into our facility and then straight out to the retailer. So it really does give you know, suppliers a fantastic opportunity to streamline, um, save some money, and also have more control over that retail execution process. So, Joshua, I'm interested, How, at what point or how early in the process does the logistics or do the logistics of this particular product enter into the design of that end cap display or however it's going to fit into that retailer, right? Because there's got to be assembly yeah. at the other end or not <laughs> assembly, and that affects... Plus all, product all to put in there, right? I mean, you, yeah. you can't have a display with no product. That, that's right. And yeah, you got to merge shipments at times, et cetera, right? Yes. So there's a complex um, marrying of, you know, those components, right? You got potentially, if your product isn't manufactured in the United States, or if it is, it's going to come from some location into our facility. So yes, it's going to have to get to our location, whether it's from that manufacturing facility, and then we bring that in, and then we marry it up, and then we will actually you know, work with those carriers for those deliveries and on all the inbounds. And then, you know, that's what the, and typically with the brand or whoever's manufacturing that product. And then on the outbound, that's where it, it can be the retailer carriers or working with our own carriers to get those picked up. So it's, it's a quite a complex process. Um, typically we would, use, we're looking at about a three to six month lead time 
I would say usually six months is when you really should be kicking this program off six to nine months out. Um, wow. Worst case scenario, right? But if you're planning for inbound products coming from you know overseas, you're going to have to start that process a little bit sooner. So again, it really depends on the type of program. If it's going in display or if it's just going into regular brown box packaging. Um, but yes, we do everything. How tough has the past year been in terms of matching up that inventory? I just like, I noticed just on the shelves again, just being in the toy section, mm. uh, it's easy to notice there because a lot of things are licensed. For example, there was like this Lego Ghostbusters set, but the Ghostbusters movie, like had, they kept delaying it due to COVID. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So eventually yeah. they just put the set out like eight months early, nine <laughs> months early, like everything uh, is so mismatched. Has that made this really difficult over the past couple of years? Yeah, it definitely has. We've we've had to be in situations where we've shipped displays with, you know, not all the product loaded onto it because some of the materials were still waiting to be received. So, you know, that, you know, that's a complex part of it, right? Like when you're working with a retailer like Walmart, like they have specific due dates and uh, timelines and OTIF that you have to follow. And so if your product is late, you get dinged. Um, so sometimes, they're we're literally shipping displays half empty and then having that product shipped directly to the store to marry up at the store level and then having an in-store execution team, you know, actually build that into the display once it gets there if the store associates don't have that communication. So, yes, it's been very complex, very difficult. Um, and what makes us unique is we have um, the visibility across all those different um, touch points. So if a brand does need to transition from like a collect to a prepaid we've been able to help them. And there's been some scenarios where we have transitioned from a collect with the retailer to prepaid, and that was able to get them on time and in full to the retailer instead of having all these extra fees and OTIF and things that come back to these brands after the fact. We don't have to worry about that because we were able to switch transition to a prepaid version where collect, we weren't seeing the same type of on time and full deliveries. Yeah. So Joshua, how much collaboration goes on with the manufacturer or the marketing team of those products in the design of the end cap, dis the end cap displays, et cetera? And, and how does that all interplay go on? Yeah, that's a ton. So on the marketing side, I mean, that could be anywhere from, you know, that six months to a year out where they're really planning of strategizing. OK, here's what we're thinking about for retail. Here's what we envision. Um, and this is how we're going to execute it based on that time frame. You know, typically what we work off is a must arrive by date or a MABD to the DCs or to the store. Um, and that's how we build our timelines back from that date and then figure out when we need to have, met, you know, the materials manufactured, when the product needs to arrive to our facility, how long it's going to take to actually co-pack and build those displays. And then what's that transit time looking like to the stores, again, depending on if you're prepaid or collect. Interesting. You know, so logistics, for example, is solving problems, right? And it's, right. it's accounting for what could go wrong and making sure that that does not happen. Um, in retail logistics, that has to be a, uh, a, a frequent concern. Anything can happen. The display could fall over. The product couldn't be there. What kind of things do you have to consider when considering the logistics behind displays? Like what can go wrong? Yeah. So the first thing that we want to consider is obviously the ability for the display and the packaging to, to arrive safely to stores, right? Like transit on its own is going to be pretty unpredictable. Um, you know, there may be, you know, depending on the type of season in the year, it may, you know, there may be really hot in the trailers or it may be really cold or the weather, you know, so there's lots of factors that go into that. And I think, you know, being able to plan in advance um, and kind of understanding what that looks like, getting all the product in advance so that we can actually perform the correct ISTA testing um, on that packaging, whether it be a drop test, compression test, slam test, shake test. Those are all things that we do in-house because we're ISTA tested certified facility. Um, so again, that is a standard release in our um, process to make sure everything does get to stores safely, right? So every, again, each, it depends on the retailer. Like if you're in Club Channel, that's going to be different than if you're shipping it to, you know, Walmart where you're getting full truckloads to maybe if you're shipping to maybe like a five below or maybe a 7-Eleven, those may be, you know, small parcel loads. So again, you got to really think about what retailer, where is it being shipped? What are those requirements and making sure you kind of plan for that. So, Joshua, does does uh, uh, the EPR legislation, those type, the Extended Producers uh, Responsibility Act and sustainability affect your business there? And if so, how is, is it affecting it now? 
It does. I mean, we, we because we're a sustainable industry, um, and we're very focused on making sure that we are doing the right things as far as like, you know, how we how we get the materials that we're using to make these corrugated packagings and boxes, yeah. right? And then what does that look like getting them to the stores? Yeah, we're we track all that and that is something that we're very focused on. And I mean it's necessary, right? Like in the world we live in, everyone wants to know like is this package going to work? Can can we take some you know packaging out of it to make it you know more sustainable or more you know? There, there's always ways to look at the packaging. So I think what makes us unique is that we kind of look at that full scope of like, okay, what's the end? What's the end result? And how is it going to get there? Wow, interesting. So what is more important, the product or the packaging? Now I realized you're a little bit biased in this one, but in your experience, how much of an impact have you seen good placement and good packaging have in retail? Yeah, I mean, I think it's incredibly important and, and it's from two factors, right? One is the safety of the product and then one is the ability to merchandise that product and make sure that it's marketed correctly to the consumer. So I think there's two factors there. One is to make sure it gets to the store safely and looks good on shelf and it hits all the marks as far as what marketing is trying to communicate in marketing and sales right, to the consumer. And then making sure that it's, you know, it's, it looks good, right? Like that. The consumer actually can see it from a distance and know what that is. And again, with our work, obviously, we're creating unique vehicles that are going into places and stores that you typically wouldn't see that, you know, on an in cap or directly on the floor. It's not, you know, just straight on the shelf. So, again, packaging is incredibly important. Um, so if you're not thinking about it, they should be. So, Joshua, when you're when you're going through the, the packaging and the shipping, et cetera, how much thought is given to uh, returns, return process or like secondary markets? Or is that like admitting defeat so you don't even think about that because they're just going to sell out? So the idea is to plan to have the most velocity on that program. Right. So the uh -huh. idea is to go back and look at the data. What is what does a typical sell through look like? in a normal traditional setting of like, okay, we're expecting to sell 15 units per week. This is going to be sitting on the floor for, I don't know, four to six weeks, you know, doing a backwards math, right? It's like, okay, we can, we need about 50 units on the display to make sure this is feasible based on how the cost of the actual display itself and then mm -hmm. how much they need to sell to make it viable, right? So I think kind of just understanding that process is important so that you know it's kind of a it's a it's a balancing act right because i mean you'll go into a store and sometimes you'll see a display that's full of product and then other times you know it'll look really empty but you know maybe it is a you know higher priced item or maybe it is just a marketing play to get some additional product into the stores so again it is very dependent on you know the retailer the time of the execution what what they're actually trying to sell Interesting. So, and how does the Bay Cities, I believe you call it Bay Cities 360, the logistics arm, how does that integrate with what you are already doing? How does that sort of fit in? Yeah. So the, what it does is it gives us the ability to kind of pivot and op offer those additional solutions. So what we were seeing was a lot of these brands were kind of feeling stuck with collect options. Um, and some of the retail relationships that we have where we're, we're managing those programs for them. And so the idea is to be able to give more visibility to the suppliers on actually how things are shipping to stores. Because when typically when we do like a collect program, we kind of lose some of that visibility, right? Like when it goes into their system, like it's it's on the retailer or whoever's getting it to the stores. We only know once it's delivered, like that's pretty much it. And then after that, it's up to them. But if we're managing the freight, we have a little bit more visibility. We have more flexibility on controlling those pickups and things. Um, when it comes to those truckers. So I think, again, it just offers us another layer of flexibility to offer those solutions. Um, again, with so many challenges within supply chain, I think just having that little bit of an edge is what helps. That makes sense. You know, we, we both used to sell freight and shippers mm -hmm. need that education too. A lot of them out there, what surprised me the most when I moved from operations selling freight was how many shippers were unaware that there was more than one payment term. If they had done prepay yeah. the whole time, they thought that's the only way you could do it. That's how it's done. If they only done collect, that's how Correct. they thought it's, and the same way with Inco terms. Like if they did FOB, they thought FOB was the only way. If they did DDP, they thought that was the only way. They didn't realize how much control they actually have over their freight and their money and how important that these tools are to wield. So you need expertise, like what Bay Cities is doing. And if they want those expertise, where should I send them to, Josh? Yeah, I mean, you can send them to baycities.com uh, or they can email me at joshua l at bay-cities.com. Um, you can obviously find me on LinkedIn at Joshua Linden. Um, I'm 
always posting content about retail and how we're uh, helping brands execute um, in unique ways. Do you have a favorite, before we let you go, do you have a favorite end cap display of all time or, or train <laughs> display or just marketing display you've seen? I have I have two. Um, one of them was would be when we, we ran a uh, pallet train for Transformers and we did a, basically it was an eight foot Optimus Prime that sat on the end of the display, which was incredible. Um, we executed that in 2,500 doors um, and it was actually assembled by the store associates, which is pretty incredible. Um, since, you know, those steps are very complicated. The other one was we, we hung a 12-foot U-wing from Star Wars when that movie originally released. Uh, I think that was back in 2006, 15, 16. And that went into the same amount of doors, 2,500 doors, and this giant U-wing hung from every single uh, Walmart store at the time. It was pretty cool. Josh, neat stuff, man. Thank you so much for your time. Go look up Joshua Linden on, on LinkedIn and Bay Cities and get your logistics and retail packaging needs. Get that peak season coming up. Thank, Thank you so you much today. Appreciate Take care. it. Right on. I was a sucker for those displays. I always wanted to like take like Jurassic Park. I remember Jurassic Park was like really big when I was 12. And I wanted to bring home like all those different Jurassic Park displays yeah. that I would have in like every Target and Walmart and every. I don't know where I would have put them. That but, would be uh, something I would collect if I had the room. If you have the room, very you have cool. the space for it. I bet Rhonda yeah. like collects all sorts of stand-ups and fat she heads does. and She's displays and everything fat like head that. Displays? Oh well, you got to tip the band, then we'll get over to it. We'll get some mindfulness for this one. Surge transportation things, not competes are stupid. Not competes chase away good talent and stop talented people from joining the supply chain industry. Tear up your not compete, it's not enforceable. Email jobs at surge instead and do what? Open up your own office tomorrow. History lesson, Michael Vincent. Oh. For over 35 years, Fleetworthy Solutions has provided a single source of solutions to help monitor and manage DOT compliance while mitigating risk for private and for hire carriers. That's right, with advanced technologies and exceptional client services, Fleetworthy becomes an extension of your team to make your company go beyond compliant. All right, Dr. Rhonda Bompenza Zimmerman. She's the director of fitness and wellness over at Global Trends. I don't know how it's taken this long to even get her on the show. <laughs> I'm not even sure. Rhonda, thanks for coming on. Hey, fellas. Great to be here with you. <laughs> now, longtime listeners, especially longtime like virtual event attendees of Freightways, yes, remember right. a couple of years ago, Emily and I, Emily Zink and I, we like championed having yoga during um, like the breakout session, the lunch yeah. session. We did a little bit right here. We did a little bit right very... here. And you were right in your studio over yeah. in Global Trans. I thought that was so cool. Um, I I would never worked at a freight company that had like yoga or wellness like like that on site. What is Global Trans thought behind all that? Like, where do you fit in over there? <laughs> well, thanks, fellas, for having me on uh, live. Uh, just in full disclosure, Vincent knows this. Last time I was on, we did the Freight Waves live at home. I couldn't hear you, so it's nice yeah. to actually hear <laughs> you this right. time. She faked it the whole time. <laughs> she, the faked that whole thing. she faked the whole thing, yeah. <laughs> I had no I had a... idea. I couldn't hear music or anything. But <laughs> so, Rhonda, anyway, up, here, so... up here, we have these little earbuds in, and I've done it, I, we've both done entire interviews before where we couldn't hear a word that the no. person was replying to us, and we simply had to go off like how their face looked when they finished yeah, the you, uh, question. Yeah. Hope they answered the right yeah. question and move on. <laughs> oh, goodness, that was quite interesting. <laughs> it's great. Well, what happened, well, kind of what happened with Global Trans is they signed me on as a vendor initially. They were building a gym, and I had participated in four startup gyms before at the university level. And I had transitioned to Arizona, and I didn't have a position. So I was like, hmm, a little curious. It was my first time entering the corporate world in the freight broker space. And I thought there was really an opportunity there to not only create this wonderful facility for exercising all our stress and doing like fun classes together, but also an opportunity to educate our population, our growing professionals about the importance of prioritizing their health in the work workplace. And we know, um, particularly recently with literature, there's a lot of what's termed LSD in the psychology space, which means a lot of loneliness, stress, and depression, mm. which is costing us $1 billion a year in healthcare or health claims. So um, what we try to do is really create a space of mindfulness where we're intentionally thinking about how we're spending our day and prioritizing our health so that we show up as our best self, physically, mentally, socially, spiritually. Um, and it's been quite a wonderful adventure. Um, I have to say I'm transitioning out of that role and I have some new things in the horizon, 
but uh, definitely see a need to continue to have conversations about the importance of our health in the workplace. And that's what I'm an advocate for because our young population is facing diseases that typically didn't happen until you were like my age. So I'm here uh, to advocate for our freight community. Her shots <laughs> fired. She shouldn't, she's taking shots at herself over here. Rhonda, you look great. I don't even know what you're talking about. Over I here. have no idea. What so you're I like what you said. I like that, but you're, but you're leaving. So you know what? Peak season's about to come up. Pretend we are two global okay. trans sales agents. We looked at our numbers and we're like, oh, I right. don't know if I'm going to make, I don't know if my 4Q is going to look good at all based on the way things are going. I'm super stressed out. I'm thinking about the holidays. Mm. I'm just thinking about making it through. How do we be mindful? What are some tips you can give Michael Vincent, the viewers out there and myself? <gasps> Well, one of the things I've always encouraged my team to do is set a little reminder on your on your station, on your on your phone, and every t- ninety minutes, just step away for one minute. Take ninety seconds if you can to just be present with yourself. One of the exercises I like to showcase with my team is called five, four, three, two, one. It's a sensory experience where you literally you can do this with me, everybody listening in where you just be mindful in the moment where you change your stress levels and your thinking patterns. And you can kind of challenge maybe those thoughts of self-doubt or worrisome, you know, what's going to happen, you know, over the course of the, of the week ahead. So what you would do, for example, <laughs> is literally just look around in your environment and notice five things. Okay. I, I noticed uh, <laughs> the championship belt, New England Motor Freight, this uh, branded what the truck cowbell, Michael Vincent's stupid big dumb face, and uh, that uh, travesty of an award that he got there for the potato salad I should have won. I noticed that I was I was made fun of twice. Yeah, what happens if things you look around? What happens? So that's five. What happens if you get like things just irritate you when you look around? <laughs> Yeah, what if it just, what if it just well, pisses well, you off? Gonna, so then we're going to shift. So then we can go to, okay, so pay attention to four things that you can hear. So try to find something positive. Four things you can hear. Something that maybe it's the sound of your computer. Maybe it's yeah. a clock ticking in the background. You know, or pay attention to something you could smell. Maybe your coffee that's sitting there. Aromatherapy. Or, you know sensory experiences in terms of what you're touching your butt cheeks on the seat you know your hat on your head and and something you can taste maybe that last cup of coffee that you had and when you're in the moment and you're present eventually your brain is not going to be able to have the capacity to worry about whatever it was that was making you anxious so it's really teaching us how to be present in the moment another thing i like to do is per- practice progressive muscle relaxation. This is something you can do when you're like really revved up and you're annoyed. At some reason, you just like curl your toes under, squeeze your butt cheeks, make a fist, just hold it and then relax and breathe, breathe. There's so much to breathing, box breathing, nostril breathing, and something you can do in under one minute that will just change the way your mind, body, and your inner spirit is really showing up because that's within your control. The other stuff that's going to happen, you it's outside of your control. So try not to focus so much on the negative and bring positivity into your life the best, best way you can. And I find those practices have really been helpful. What about like a, a stretch, a tension stress? So like we're, we're, we're at the desk. We're watching this on demand. We're watching what the truck on, on LinkedIn Live maybe. What, what should you do to, to get loose now? So one of the things I like people to do is just do a shoulder roll up and back. And then when you get back there, just leave your shoulders down. If you can, fellas, I don't know if you have room behind you, interlace your fingers behind you so you can expand your stress or excuse me, ex- expand your uh, chest. Okay. <laughs> because we kind of sit, I don't know if you can see me, kind of hunched up a lot. Our posture is really slop, sloppy and that creates some negative energy, trapped energy in body. And just doesn't that feel better? Oh yeah. No, uh, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Fabulous. But how do I how, but what happens is then you when you take the hands away cuz you got to type like you just you, you go right back like this. Don't go back. Well, that's why <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that, well, you know, it's funny. We definitely notice if we do like a posture assessment, if you just stand against a wall, put your shoulders back, put your heels up against the wall, try to move away from the wall after you're standing in that posture and hold it as much as you can during the day. So again, it's just about being mindful. So if you notice you're like feeling irritated, annoyed, you can't really solve a problem, hmm, check your posture, do a shoulder roll, clasp your fingers behind you, expand your chest reset and let yourself go back to work. It really does change the energy. When we get stressed, we 
hold stress in our bodies, in our, mm. t- in our, in our tissues. So there's something to be said really about the power of movement throughout the day. So I, that would be another thing I would encourage people to do. Yeah, I totally get it. The, the, the positive energy and mental health that you can get from, from, uh, from exercise. I've been practicing that for a long time in my life. And it's funny because it's relaxation and, and stress or, or, or exertion of the exercise that helps, right? Both that mindful mm-hmm. relaxation and also lifting weights or running can just set that mind mm-hmm. right and get those endorphins running, that type of stuff. How does nutrition play into it? Do you work with them on uh, the people on nutrition as well? Yes, we do talk about nutrition. So again, when we're stressed, our body is going to produce more cortisol. When more cortisol is in our body, we just naturally are going to gravitate towards processed sugary foods. That's our body's way of saying, hmm, I need a little pick-me-up. So when you become mindful of what you're eating, pay attention to how you're feeling before you make a choice of whatever. Notice how you're feeling when you eat and then how you feel after you eat. When you pay attention to those body cues, that's when you can kind of start to shift what you're choosing to eat. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes when I'm having a bad day, like just McDonald's sounds good. But when I notice how I feel afterwards, yeah. particularly the next morning morning from all the water retention, I don't know if I can curse, but like it feels pretty shitty. So when you start to, <laughs> so what I like to tell people is pay attention to how your body feels. You're not going to sleep as well. You're going to feel puffy not maybe some brain fog. And when we start to pay attention to how you feel, then we can talk about, okay, let's explore some of our food choices. I'm not one who likes to put somebody on some fast food or excuse me, some sort sort of diet. I like to look culturally, um, relationally, Mm. like what are you eating? What, what means something to you in terms of the food selection you have, and then trying to make more nutritious, nutritious choices based upon somebody's beliefs, their traditions and their values, and the whole sense of also being mindful when you eat. How many of us sit at our freight broker desk and are eating? We don't even get up. Mm, There's no separation. So if you can just step outside your break, take it. That 30 minutes to sit, enjoy your food. Your body's just going to reap the nutrients so Stop eating almonds. Stop eating all those almonds with your bacteria-covered fingers, you know, you grub. Just <laughs> knock it off. Well, Rhonda, before we let you go, you got one more sort of quick exercise we can we can do to make ourselves centered going into the week? Hmm. Well, I have some dice here, and I was going to give you guys a challenge, but I don't okay. know if you okay. could do it. This well, is something we'll see. Like, so Let's like, see. So I'm, I'm going to roll the dice on the ground. This is something I'd also encourage people to get, your little okay. set of dice. And it says uh, 10 squares. 10, ten squats. So you got right. up pretty easy. 10, <laughs> ten squats. Air squats. All right. Yeah, yeah, do, uh, 10 squats Again, for you. Just uh, every 90 minutes. Come over here. Every dice. 90 minutes. All right. Well, let's get up. Try. Move your butt. Reduce dead butt syndrome. Oh, look at this. One, two. Good. Inhale. Exhale. Three. Inhale. Exhale. Four. Inhale. Exhale. Five. Squeeze those cheeks on the way up. Inhale. Exhale. Six. Put a smile on your face. Seven. Good. Michael, I like the arms going. Eight. Two more. Inhale. Exhale. Nine. Last one. Ten. Oh, you guys get a cowbell. I wish I had one for you. Well, but is that okay without weights? Like, don't we need some weights on that or just our own our own oh, butt? No. Air squats so, are good. So as a result of the pandemic, I've really encouraged people to do body weight exercises. So you don't need to, you know, have massive amount of weights. Just by engaging, contracting your muscles, again, you're re- you're using energy, you're building muscle, and it just feels good to just be with yourself, be with your being without all the other ad- additives. So and the no, heavier no you are, required. the stronger you'll get. That's exactly right. Right? Yeah. So, so there's it, no negative it, to just getting heavier and heavier. <laughs> no, yeah. As long as you can do the squat. Let's go. <laughs> Super sorry. Hey, Rhonda, we really appreciate it. Good luck in uh, your new role. Thank you for giving us this great advice here. And we'll have you back on Sooner to get more mindfulness. Awesome. Great to spend time with you, gentlemen. Have a great one. Take it Thanks, easy. Rhonda. Go find her on LinkedIn, too. Super nice. Absolutely. All right, I what's going it. on this week? How about putting a bath in a truck? Take a look at this yeah, video. Good idea. So I'm just oh. in this lovely lay-by on the A11, and I really could do with a bath. So that's just what I'm going to do. So I've got my bath mat out. Stick the plug in. 
Let's run the bath. Here we go. I'm going to get into some TikTok friendly bath attire. Think that'll do? Hmm. A bath bomb, I think. Just give that a little mix up. I'm quite looking forward to this. Oh, let's get in then. Oh, that's lovely and warm. It's nice, actually. Oh, it's a bit cramped, but we make it work. Oh, this is really, really hot. This is the life. This is. 45 minute break and a little. Oh, whoopsie. Oh, one of snow bats. Right, let's lay back and relax. In here as well, we have in bath entertainment. Set an alarm in case we fall asleep in the bath. Infotainment, we can turn that on. Get a bit of radio through the windows. Roof hatch. Yeah, that can all be done from the comfort of your bath. How long we had on break? Oh, we've had 34 <laughs> minutes. Right? <laughs> Do you want uh, to take a bath in a t shirt? Get ready to go again. Oh, I'm going uh, to get bath, no. <laughs> I just shower in my rash guard. That's, that's my move. You shower in that's your bad. shirt? A rash guard, you know? <laughs> now we just need to pull the plug. And I'll let so, where does this go? It just falls out the bottom, it just drains out the bottom of the tub. I don't know. What are the rules on draining just gray water out onto the street? Are you I don't know. How's do he that? filled in the first place? That, that's I, what we're he, he's got a heater on there somehow. Maybe he's running across his turbo. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> he may have one of those instant, instant things. So I, I have no idea. Check this out, though. I want you to tell me who you think lifted this better. we got two videos here. Okay, it's a little forklift competition. The forklift competition here. I've seen some well, very what is this talented guy? Is people. this guy even doing anything? Yes, this guy is helping this guy get around a tight turn. Watch this. He's going to lift that ass end up and move it over so he does not clip that building. Interesting. So that's what he's doing there. Yeah, yeah. He's helping him cut that corner. Now, this of, guy's... Now, what about this? Whoa, all right. right. This guy's taking down an empty stack. Obviously, that's an empty container. Yeah, he's it losing full, it, though. He'd be, he'd be done. Um. Yeah, he saved it. Uh, yeah. Who did the better job? I mean, visually that looks much more impressive. But you know, the same can be said for the little because, like, I saw a lot of comments about the first one. Yeah, and people were just like, "He's doing nothing. He's uh, being lazy. No, he's that's being talent, slacker. bro. Get on that that lift and do that." And keep up with the truck and, and not and get keep up over. with the truck and not screw up that driver or push it over or do anything like that. No, that's some ser both of them serious talent. The fur and neither one of them safe. So which one? Which one do you think? <laughs> Second one. Um, I'm going with the first one. All right, I'll take the second one. Okay, just, to, just to be different. How about this though? Take a look at this container delivery over here. High speed on the freeway. Things moving down. There's your pod, Justin Martin, and moving into his new is. house, and there it goes. Other side. Of the freeway. Call me when you fill it up. Just dumped over. <laughs> Got to be careful out there. Call me when you fill it. See, you, you, that's why I'm always scared of flat. You think he was listening to uh, the tunes of uh, the newest AI rapper in the I world? I don't know, but we've got videos of it, my friend. Let's bring those up and take a look at that. What do you think of this guy, Dooner? Or this Can being? we hear him? <laughs> right here, the AI rapper. Watch this. Oh, here we go. So, wait. What am I looking at here? This is CGI, obviously, with the rings, right? No, no, no. Oh, that's yeah. a real person running. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so what, like, what are the, what are people watching this on? Like on know. TikTok, you watch the AI do this? I guess, yeah. This is the newest thing. I, I guess this is how you do so it. Where's man. this song? Check it out. Check it out. So he's he's got a supreme samurai sword. He's killing it. And he's Xbox. cutting an Xbox uh, Series X in half. And that's his music. All right. Well, CNN says a robot rapper. Yeah. He has 10 million followers on TikTok. He's been signed by Capitol Records. So you out there who've you know, got like 10 TikTok followers, nobody <laughs> likes your stuff. Well, look, look at this <laughs> robot right here. He's doing better than you are. Yeah. His name is FN Mika. He's the world's first augmented reality artist to sign with a major label. He's got over a billion views on TikTok. He's the platform's top virtual being, not the first virtual being, but the top one. Uh, what else does it say about it? He's got a de debut single called Florida Water. It was released this week. It's in collaboration with Billboard chart topper Gunna. And know what happened to Gunna? He's facing charges in a Rico case alongside <laughs> Young Thug, who are apparently real rappers, and a Fortnite player named Click, so I also think is not an augmented reality. No, it, no it's an actual voice, they say. It but is an actual voice. Meek is... is, is a human. It's just the music yes. that's an algorithm. It's a human with some decent marketing. Right, call me back um, when they are all yeah. AI, right? When it's not like when it's a voice, I don't know. How is that different than anything else? I, I don't think it's, it's, it's just a, it's an expensive, cool looking music video. I think MTV did this back in the day. <laughs> you know, people are worried about like autonomous <laughs> trucks taking like everyone's job. Like <laughs> automation's coming for everybody. Us up here, the uh, rappers, right? The, even the ones in Rico cases. Now they're getting upstaged by 
by yeah. that guy. Yeah, he, I mean, well, he's building some street cred. Yeah. Well, you're afraid of heights at all? Yes. Okay. Do you, you're afraid of like the open water or anything? So you like survival horror? You ever see open water or the shallows or uh, any of the movies where people are just stuck? Oh, a Frozen, not the animated one, the one where they're stuck on a ski lift? Yeah. Survival horror. Yes. Are you a fan of it? Yeah, it's pretty good. All right, like roll it, this actually. trailer. This yeah. new movie I saw over the weekend. It was called The Fall. Or no, not even The Fall. It's just called Fall. Oh, it's uh, even better. This is one of those movies where it starts out, right? There's the whole plot of this movie. Is there's these two girls, and they climb a 2,000-foot-tall radio tower, and they get stuck up there. The oh, movie okay. opens, and it's a lot like Cliffhanger or Vertical Limit. Look at so the bolts on that thing. <laughs> the main character, she's out rock climbing with some friends, and there's a tragedy. One of her friends dies during it. And then she gets depressed, and she starts drinking a whole bunch. And that's like the whole first 15 minutes. Like, her life's in shambles over this. So okay. her friend, who is like a mild level Instagram uh, influencer, says, hey, yeah. we should climb this tower. Get out of the house. It'll make you feel better. They do. They climb up to this to the top of this thing and a bunch of hijinks ensue. Like ladder falls off this thing. They shoot a flare gun up in the sky and these meth addicts see it. And they end up, instead of helping them, they steal their car. <laughs> There's a whole thing with like vultures going on. Vultures, she's like pretending to pass out. A vulture's eating her leg. She grabs the vulture by her neck and kills it and eats it alive. She shoves a cell phone in her friend's stomach and pushes her off the side of the tower nice. so a text will go through. It's great. Find me on Twitter at Timothy Dooner. Find him at Vincent Dude. Don't be a stranger and tell him how to be. Feast and love. Spread it everywhere. <laughs>